what we're talking about together as a church in uh, this season and the important things about doing life and doing Jesus together. Now, there are a variety of churches within just a few miles of here, every shape, flavor, size, all those things. And uh, we're thankful for partnerships with our sister churches, uh, different churches to reach different people, and we celebrate that any time. Now, there's a, there's a trend in our nation, and it is uh, to uh, compromise on something that's key to us, and that is the Word of God, to uh, water it down, to, to turn back from it, to abandon the Bible is authoritative as the word of God that when the Bible speaks God speaks and we we honor it and respect it and we want to be that kind of church now today with all that variety of churches I want to talk about something that does set us apart from a lot of other churches in the country and in uh, North Texas it's how we do ministry here and some of you this is this is different than maybe you're used to church being done, but this is how we believe God has led us to do our ministry, and this makes us different than a lot of places. And it's about this issue of together. We have felt led to lead our church to build our ministry primarily around our groups, and group is a big deal to us. Uh, some of you, like me, will often call it Sunday school, Bible fellowship groups, small groups, but we, we focus heavily on groups and that's, that's made us a little different than a lot of places. In fact, we celebrate that it's a good day when we have as many or more people in groups in the course of a day or a Sunday or a week than we're going to have in a worship hour. There are a lot of places that they have their, their worship crowd, and they're celebrating if 5 to 10 percent, this is common in our 5 to 10 percent of their worship population is going to be in any kind of group during the course of a week. And they're pretty excited about that. For us, we believe the flip side of that is what shows church health for us. It shows that we're, we're, that's where we keep our scorecard of winning the game is when people are not just in the large gathering, they're also in a group. So that's a, a little bit about us. Makes us different than a lot of places. And uh, I want to explain a little bit about what we do and why we do it. So when I'm not here, I visit, like to visit other churches. I love going to other churches. And as a guy who visits other churches, as a pastor who visits other churches, I do what I make Rhonda do this with me. Uh, we sit in the back. Oh, uh, that's because uh, I can see everything. And it's hard for me to take off my pastor leader hat and just be in the moment. I really have to spend a lot of time in prayer about that uh, because I come in and I say, well, that, there's a light bulb out. There's a misspelled word in the bulletin. That, I wouldn't have done it that way. That should be different. And you, start, you just start going through this list of uh, things that you notice. Because I notice it here every time it happens. And I notice it everywhere else. But one of the things I do notice in a lot of churches, I go, great sermon, great music, great experience for me. But I've noticed this part of it, the going in, the coming out. And I watch people come in on their own and I watch people walk out on their own and there's no interaction between uh, people and there's a big trend in our uh, American Christianity expressions of the the anonymous church attender that nobody knows me and I don't know anybody and I kind of like it that way and I'm going to come in and I'm going to have my experience and I'm walking out but there's no encouragement no accountability no relationship no group and uh, it's just not how God's designed the Christian life to be lived the Bible at every imaginable level says it's not supposed to be like that somebody needs to know your name somebody needs to care about your life and you need to care about other people's life that's how the Bible describes this thing of the Christian life nobody flies solo and we're intended by God called by God to live this Christian life together now the Bible says this Romans 12 since we are all one body in Christ we belong to each other belong to each other and each of us needs all the others why don't you turn to somebody close by and say you need me 
ok thank you yeah okay now spin that around go ahead and do a little humility and say well I need you too okay there we go okay thanks for playing along the first service just started talking about other things and we just about lost the whole thing thank you for staying on track Listen, God wants a family, and he created you to be a part of it. It's one of God's core purposes for your life, which he planned for you before you were born. The entire Bible is a story of God, God assembling a family, building a family, a family that will love him, honor him, serve him, and be with him forever and eternity. The Bible says his unchanging plan has always been to adopt us, What a beautiful word, adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. Oh, we want to please God. And that brings him great pleasure. The trouble is, like with a lot of things, that's the plan God has. And what do we do? Plan's here and we're living it out here. We're outside of God's plan. We say, well, I think I know better than God. I think I like this. One of the things that's happened in... uh, our culture is we're more connected than ever because of social media stuff and we're more disconnected than ever from relationships and it's caused us to pull back and pull back and pull back the number of people who identify as introverts or uh, social anxiety things has has gone off the charts because we're hiding away from other people thinking that some sort of online presence is the same thing as people and what we discover is it's skimming the surface and we're wrecking God's plan for relationships and it happens in Christian lives too and we just want to do better than that it's not what God intends Uh, the Bible says God himself has commanded that we must not only love him a lot of people oh I love God we must also love our Christian brothers and sisters love them too well I love God it's just Christians I don't like that's how A lot of people seem to approach this thing. Well, you know what? It's both and. We have to love our other believers. Paul wrote this. He said, I've written that you may know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. Back to the family, God's family, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Church is a family. Uh, Sometimes people say, when's the church going to do something about this? When's the church going to get into this ministry? No, no. My response, if you come to me with that, is, well, you tell me because you're the church. Church isn't a building. It's not an institution. It's not an, uh, some organization. It's not a program. The church is the people that God assembles in a place to do his work and to fulfill his plan, his will. The church is a family. Now, you hear people say this all the time. This is a regular part of conversations we have out in our city as we go out and doing a lot of contacting here there and everywhere I'm a Christian I just don't belong to any church this is just a regular part of the the conversation many of you have had those kind of conversations with a neighbor a friend somebody at work yeah I'm a Christian I'm a follower of Jesus I just I'm not a part of any church and uh, what I would say is well that doesn't even make sense that, that is so anti-Christ. It's so contrary to God's word. There's no possible way you can get there and say, I believe the Bible's true, because the Bible tells such a dramatically different story than that. It's like saying, I'm a football player. I'm just not a part of any team. I don't think you're a football player. I, I think that there's something that's breaking down here. There are no... Uh, free agent floating around football players you got to be a part of a team every team has its roster every school has its enrollment every army has its enlistment and being a part of the body of christ the church is a key part of being a follower of jesus christ and you can't separate those things out god meant you to be a part of a family a christian a follower of jesus without a church family is a spiritual orphan and it's a tragedy when there are orphans in the world. And it's a tragedy when someone's a spiritual orphan. Now, in our church context, if you're going to connect deeply with other people going through life together, it's probably not going to happen in here. 
And this is something I have remi- I'll continue to remind us of. And I need the reminder. We all need the reminder. It's not going to happen in here. Probably that greeting time probably didn't make a lifelong friend in that, that kind of experience. In our context, it's in our Bible fellowship groups, our Sunday school, our small group ministry. That's where the church gets to really be the church. And that's how our ministry is carried out. That's how we care for one another. That's how we grow. That's how we do the one another's of the Bible. Many of the people, in fact, a little over half the people who are members of our church did not grow up in a Baptist church. So I recognize a lot of people come from other backgrounds where small group ministry is like, or Sunday school is, that's something kids do. Kids do Sunday school, adults go to worship. But for us, uh, it's also a both end. We believe that we ought to do, we need, there's, there are things that happen in here that are unique to this gathering, things that we focus on here that are unique to here and there are unique things that happen in a small group setting and you need both of those things to be a fully developing follower of Christ so that's what we're going to encourage today now we follow Jesus teaching we follow Jesus example and if we look at Jesus teaching we look at Jesus example we find that Jesus he preached to multitudes he preached to the big crowds and by the way as his ministry went closer and closer to the cross the crowds got smaller and smaller and smaller and uh, as we get down to, okay, the crucifixion is now looming. It's just about down to a handful of people, to the 12 and to a few others. That's where Jesus spent most of his time, and that's where most of his teaching gets invested. It's in a group. And so if we look at how Jesus did his group, and we're going to look through several chapters in John's gospel coming off of that moving toward the cross moment from chapter 11 we're going to see there's some big lessons we need to learn we need to embrace about doing group well so we're looking at Jesus Bible fellowship group today and we understand a little better why we need we need this so let's look at John chapter 11 and this just gives us our beginning and we'll start moving through these chapters rapidly verse 53 chapter 11 so from that day on they plotted to kill him. You feel like you kind of came in the middle of a story there, don't you? Yeah, what, what's happened is Jesus has been rubbing the religious establishment in all the wrong ways. That he, he, is, he has been so abrasive to them, and they so offended them, so set them off. And then the miracle, he has raised Lazarus, his friend Lazarus, from the dead. And that has created such a stir in and around Jerusalem that they recognize, okay, we, we have to take him out. We cannot manage the problem that is Jesus. If he's our problem and we cannot manage it. We are going to have to destroy him. So that's verse 53. So here's what Jesus did in response in verse 54. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but departed from there to the countryside near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, And he stayed there with the disciples. Now, when we think about group, I recognize that just about everybody has some kind of group they're part of. Not many people completely isolate themselves from people. They fly all solo all the time. That's highly unusual. We have lots of groups. A lot of groups wrapped around a hobby, wrapped around some organization that you're a part of, wrapped around uh, what your kids are involved in. A lot of people have a group, but the things that I'm about to talk about in a Bible fellowship group, a small group, uh, Sunday school, these things are things that it's going to be a rare occasion when these things happen in any of those other groups where it's wrapped around the things of God and where you're being encouraged in the things of God. And so I'm going to make this run. It's, uh, It's only most of the Gospel of John shouldn't take till the weather changes again here we go number one and I'm just calling this Jesus Bible Fellowship Group uh, BFG and uh, here's the first thing a Bible Fellowship Group should focus on love for Jesus so if we drop down from chapter 11 to chapter 12 here's what's happening Jesus 
It says they gave a dinner for him, for Jesus there. And Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Always good to have a guy who was dead a couple of days earlier hanging out with you, right? Then... We see, when this little band of followers gathered, Jesus was always in the middle of the gathering. It was all about Jesus. We see this uh, a few verses down where Mary, she has this expensive container of uh, perfume, uh, extravagant cost, and she breaks it open. She pours it on Jesus' feet and wipes his feet with her hair. It's customary to wash the feet of a guest, but this was extravagant love. Everything's wrapped around Jesus. The chapter goes on to tell about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the Pharisees comment about it. Look, the world has gone after him. Well, that's how it felt to them. Like, oh, man, we're trying to, we're trying to bring this Jesus thing down a notch. And it's just exploding all over us. The whole world has gone after him. Truth is, it hadn't all gone after him. Judas was a part of this group. Judas didn't get it. He wasn't connected. The chief priests and scribes, the Pharisees, they're they're not getting it. There are plenty of people who weren't focused in the right spots, who weren't following after him. But the people who figured out this thing, this whole life thing is about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Their lives were transformed because that's the difference that is made when whatever you're gathering together about is Jesus now in your group I want to encourage you in your group a lot of you in existing groups keep the focus on Jesus his example his will his ways his power because he'll do a transforming work in you and through you chapter 12 tells about some Greek spiritual seekers they come to we're still in chapter 12 of John some Greek spiritual seekers they they come up to Jesus' disciples because they figure these guys know Jesus they're seeing how their lives have been changed by Jesus so they say surely you can connect us to Jesus which is a pretty awesome testimony they saw enough in these guys to say whatever God's doing Jesus is doing in their lives I want him to do that in my life too and they said we want to see Jesus we wish to see Jesus well If you lift up Jesus in your group, people be drawn. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. Lift up Jesus. Make Jesus important, prominent, visible, tangible in your group setting. And people start coming to your group. People be attracted to your group. People be attracted to your life together as a group of people following after the Lord. And if you're lifting up anything else, the focus is anything else, Uh, you're probably going to stay right where you are doing the same things you've been doing. Second thing, a BFG, a Bible fellowship group, a small group wrapped around Jesus. Well, you ought to be loving one another. This is chapter 13. The setting for chapter 13 begins in the upper room. And Jesus does this. By the way, next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're going to focus on this part of the story. Jesus and and what happened in the upper room. Jesus... uh, with his disciples are celebrating the Passover. It's a special time. It's a family time. We'll find next Sunday. He's there with his disciples, his group. But Jesus kicked off the evening with this craziest of all moves. The most important guy, the guy it's all about. It's all about Jesus. He washes the disciples' feet. This is this is reserved for the lowest, lowliest person in the household. That particular responsibility. I mean, nobody. I I don't know how you care about your feet, but I don't care about your feet much. You know, I'm not a really foot guy. Um, Jesus does, and these guys are walking through the refuse of the world with their their bare feet, and uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Why did he do such a thing? Every church, I, I talk to people all the time, so I go to church. Tell me about your church. Oh, we said the friendliest church ever. Everybody loves everybody. It's the friendliest church ever. Everybody thinks their church is the friendliest church ever until you go to their church and you go, I walked in, walked out. I tried to engage people in conversation. People stepped on me, walked around me. I was invisible. Uh, my favorite 
church experiences. Some of you heard my crazy, some, I have a lot of crazy church experiences in my history. This one came when I was in seminary, and some of you have heard my history, crazy seminary story about supply preaching. I was 23 years old, invited a bivocational pastor to go out to a country church outside of uh, Fort Worth, west of Fort Worth. Go, to, go out 20, turn off the highway, and off we go into a bunch of trees and this little sweet little country church sitting out there. I walk in, and I got there early before anybody else, and I was there as people were coming in, and I was watching them, and there were hugs and kisses and handshakes and all this stuff going on, and I see it coming in from the parking area, a gravel parking lot in this country church. I see them coming in. They're coming to the building, and it's still going, but rapidly I see, a, I see a pattern emerge. The pastor didn't tell me about this before I went because he thought it would be fun for me to see it. There are two families that dominated this church. Small center aisle, maybe 75 people in the building. One family was on this side and one family was on this side. But it was the Hatfields and McCoys because nobody spoke to anybody on the other side of that aisle. Not a person. They did not acknowledge the other side of the building was there. For the whole morning, it was a fascinating sociological experience. Not a lot of Jesus, but a lot of sociology as I studied that but you know what both of them said because coming out I said well yeah, tell me about your church because I knew something about their church now the, pa- the pastor couldn't wait to talk to me about it oh yeah it's the craziest thing ever I've been working on it for years they hate each other always had the friendliest church we just love each other in this church they said it in that con- context it happens all the time everybody thinks they have a, a friendly church but by Jesus example Jesus said well okay you really love one another let me show you what love looks like. And he did something, because love is always an action in the Bible. It's never, oh, I feel something in my spirit. I feel something in my heart for somebody else. That's not what love is. Love's not a feeling. It's an action in God's economy. And so are you, are you serving one another is one of the measures. Jesus served them to demonstrate his love in the most tangible of ways. So Jesus sets the standard high. It's not based on... I love my church. We, we tolerate each other at a very high level. We get along mostly. We haven't had a just duke it out kind of thing in church in years now. We're awesome. What a great church. It's got to be better than that, right? Jesus makes the standard of love clear on how we should love one another. I give you a new command, he said. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Okay, it's not just love one another. It's as I have loved you. Well, now the bar is more than a little bit high. How did Jesus love? Jesus loved sacrificially. He loved with a whole lot of grace. He loved with a whole lot of forgiveness. He loved with a whole lot of patience, compassion. He loved in such a way that he laid down his life for these folks. How are you and your group doing at loving one another like that jesus says by this everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another do you love one another that you're doing something to demonstrate that love is there is there a measurable a tangible expression of love third a bible fellowship group ought to be an encouraging environment we talked about this with the kids a little bit jesus rallied his friends in this time of impending darkness and doom because they're in jerusalem they know our lives are threatened by everything that's taking place. We, they, they knew they want to kill Jesus, and we're hanging out with Jesus. That puts us in a bit of peril this day. They were afraid. They didn't understand where the road was going from here. Jesus had told them multiple times at this point, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be crucified. And I'm going to be dying. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. And what we find in the disciples, they kept saying, I wonder what he meant by that. He meant exactly what he said. They're undone by what Jesus has been saying. And so the 14th chapter begins, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't let your heart be troubled. Jesus was a wonderful encourager. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this one, but how many of us came walking in here somewhere for some reason? We just need some encouragement today because it's hard because something's dark, because something is uh, weighing on us. 
And you just need an encouraging word. Your, your Bible fellowship group ought to be an environment where uh, encouragement is prominent in what takes place. We all need people to encourage us. I need encouragement on a regular basis, so do you. Will Rogers has a great quote. He said once, we can't all be heroes because someone has to sit on the curb and clap for them when they go by. Sometimes I need, you, don't you just need somebody to clap for you a little bit and cheer you on? To keep you afloat? To help you make it through the day? Paul said, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Because as we move toward the second coming, I mentioned this earlier, we were, talking, we were singing about heaven, talking about heaven. It's going to get worse before it gets better. The Bible tells us that as we move into the end, last, the end days, the last times, the end times, toward the second coming. It's going to get tough. And as it gets tougher and tougher, and goodness, we're still, it's already horrible in a lot of places in the world. Uh, we're uh, barely, barely touching any of that in this country at this point compared to the rest of the world. We're going to need a lot of encouragement. However, it's not just good job, hang in there, you can do it. It's not just those levels of encouragement because there's another kind of encouragement we need to give each other in such days. The Bible tells us, let us watch out for one another. That's a good word. To provoke love and good works. We're to encourage one another, not just good job with what you're doing, but I got to care enough about your life. You need to care enough about my life to encourage a next step with God, to encourage spiritual growth, to encourage service, to encourage commitment. I, you know, I don't want to settle for sameness in my own spiritual life. And I, I, before God, I can't, I can't be the kind of person that lets other people stagnate spiritually. If I love my church family, if I love my family of faith, if I love my, my small group of believers, I sure enough want to encourage them to take a next step with God because that's going to be so key to being a faithful follower of Jesus. A Bible fellowship group should be a producer of spiritual fruit. How about that one? Jesus is teaching his disciples in chapter 15, John 15, many of you are familiar with that. It's a beautiful, in so many ways, a poetic chapter and such a convicting chapter. And Jesus uses an illustration of a grapevine and its branches. And so here's the vine, it's in the soil, and it comes up like the trunk of the, the, the grapevine. And then the branches, the fruit is produced in the branches that is connected to the vine. You break off that branch, it's not going to produce any grapes, it's not going to produce any fruit. So he says, just as the branch has to be connected to the vine, so you need to be connected to me. You need to be connected, you're not connected to Jesus, close, close connection to Jesus, you're not going to produce spiritual fruit. So the application is clear. I'm the vine, you're the branches. The one who remains in me, abides in me, connected to me, and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. That is absolutely true. Nothing eternal happens apart from Jesus. But he goes on. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Not just temporary, not just for the moment, but spiritual fruit that will last. Now, Spiritual fruit is one of the indicators. That it's, it's a diagnostic. It's one of the indicators you belong to Jesus. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. You're going to go to heaven when you die? Oh, yeah, I'm sure about that. Okay, tell me how you know that. What evidence do you have? What, what metrics would, would point in that direction in, in your life? Well, you know, try to be a good person. You know, kind of do some good stuff for once in a while. Give, give some money here and there. And, uh, you know, I'm probably okay. The Bible says one of the key indicators you belong to Jesus is there's eternal spiritual fruit flowing out of your life and that happens great in a group context does spiritual fruitfulness back up your faith claims in Christ that's a big question and how about this let's back it up and say how about your group efforts you say oh yeah we're believers oh we're mature Christians in our class in our group uh, in our BFG, we, uh, we do so great together. Okay, well, let's see. Is that really true? What evidence is there of fruitfulness, spiritual life in your Bible fellowship group? And evaluate. I mean, you're evaluating everything else in life. We love to evaluate 
restaurants and doctor's offices and everything else. We're always filling out what we like, we didn't like about everything everywhere. What about, what about your Bible fellowship group? Maybe you ask a few questions like, has anyone come to faith in Christ in the last year as a result of our ministry together as a group? Anybody? What marriages have been saved or strengthened as a result of our group efforts? Who stepped up to be more obedient to God and just the basic foundational things of discipleship? You know, you, you attend, you give, you serve, that kind of stuff. Who stepped up to ministry and who stepped out to mission from your group in the last year? Uh, are you reaching out beyond yourselves? Is, is your time together about more than just an hour on Sunday? Is eternity being touched? Are new people being brought in? Are new people being cared for? Are new people being included? New people becoming a part of the family? I'm telling you, we have a, such a knowledge-based Christianity in how we do a lot of this that it's all about... Uh, another Bible study and another Bible study and another Bible study we're not doing anything about our Bible study nobody's lives are being changed nothing's being transformed that's not really God's purpose for his word sitting in a room on Sunday talking about God and about the Bible is not the end game but if you're all connected to Christ fruitful things will start happening and Jesus says it's fruit that will last this isn't just the temporary feel better for a day feel better for the hour this is fruit and last for all eternity. Fifth thing, a Bible fellowship group, a small group, Sunday school class ought to be a place of accountability. Wow, that's scary for a lot of people, but accountability is a good word. Chapter 16, Jesus begins the chapter. I've told you these things. He's told them a lot of things by the time he gets to the beginning of chapter 16. I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. I care about you, and I care about you enough that I don't want you to fall out of the game. I don't want Satan to be able to take you out. I don't want you to drift away, run away from God. Now, the Bible says, Romans, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And we, I hope you recognize that. We're all going to give an account of ourselves to God. God said, what did you do with everything I gave you? What did you do with all, all the time, talent, treasure I've entrusted to you? How did you use that for my kingdom glory? This is personal accountability to God, but the Bible's really clear about this part, too. We have an accountability to one another there's a lot of one another accountability that we we are the body of Christ the church and we ought to be caring about one another 1 Corinthians uh, 12 Paul talks about it and he says Christians are all a part of the same body this body of Christ Christ the head each of us a part of it and we need we belong to one another and it suggests that there's a lot of accountability that needs to happen as a result of that because if I'm an arm in the body of Christ and I'm trying to function out here on my own, something's going undone in the life of the church, in the life of your small group. And if someone just disappears and tries to play solo out there, I'm a Christian, uh, Christian solo guy, uh, it's going to get dark in a hurry and we need, to be, we need to be caring about one another enough that everybody has somebody they, they can pray with, they can confide in, they can listen to, they can encourage. And a Bible fellowship group is how we're organized to do a lot of that stuff. But it needs to be fully functioning when we get in those groups. So accountability. I, I've had people through the years of ministry, 30-something years of ministry that have said, I left the church. Why'd you leave the church? Well, because I'd been gone for six weeks, and I show up, and somebody says, hey, we've been missing you. I'm so glad you're here. And they're, they're offended by that. Hey, be grateful. Somebody cares about you. Be grateful. Somebody missed you. That there was, there was something absent in the church that they're glad has returned. But we ought to have that kind of accountability that's an encouraging accountability. They care about your spiritual health. And here's the other thing. In your groups, don't be afraid to check up on the people in your group. You know, our groups all have a role, a list of names. Sometimes we look at that list of names. I don't even know who these people are. Well, why not? 
Go find out who they are. Say, hey, you're on a roll. I don't think I know you. Uh, are you a part of a group? Are you attending? Sometimes, oh, we join another church. Awesome. I just want to be sure that you were part of a church family. That's great. But for most of the people that are going to be there, it's going to be people that just fell through the cracks somewhere along the, for a thousand different reasons. Sometimes it's just missed a Sunday because of this, missed a Sunday because of that, missed a Sunday because of that. And suddenly what started out as three Sundays with good reasons just becomes a habit that they wake up and I haven't been to church in five years. We don't want people to fall into those kind of cracks. Well, it's none of my business. Oh, it's your business. It is absolutely the business of the body of Christ to care about the body. Satan, how he best functions in knocking people out of the game is to pick them off when they're flying solo. There is safety in numbers. And there's safety in being in an accountable group. You get outside of a group, you're flying solo, Satan wrecks lives regularly. The Christian life was designed by God to be lived in community. Be accountable to one another. Sixth thing, Bible fellowship group, small group, Sunday school, ought to be a stronghold of prayer. This is John 17. John 17 is the high priestly prayer. We talk about the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, but that's more the model prayer. This is, John 17 is Jesus praying. And it is such a powerful prayer. And it reminds me, when you get together with your group, as Jesus got together with his group, prayer was often a big part of that gathering. The biggest part of our prayer ministry in our church happens in our groups. Be in your group. So if somebody's praying for you about the big things of your life, uh, you should not have to, I mean, I'm praying about things for myself and for me and mine all the time. But I invite a lot of other people into my life to pray for me and to pray for mine because we need each other in prayer. So big part of our prayer, your hurts, your, your needs, your fears, your growth areas, our mission in the world, we, we pray. Jesus' example here, though, is different than a lot of our praying. Sometimes our praying, in, we, we're afraid to really put our cards on the table, I guess. And so we, we pray at this nebulous uh, sort of level of, well, I have a... I have a lady I work with, her great aunt's mother's cousin, sister's brother's dog. Man, I don't, I'm not sure we're praying anymore the way God really intends for us to pray. I think he has better for us than that. And to go ahead and pray about things that really matter. And we look at what Jesus was asking, what he prayed for them. It's pretty stout stuff to be praying for one another in your group. How about, he prayed for spiritual protection. He prayed for unity with those believers. He prayed for spiritual safety, sustained joy, protection from Satan's attacks, that God would make them holy as they were exposed to the truth of his word, that they'd be on mission in the world, and they'd be sharing the good news of Jesus in the world. Those are pretty, pretty good prayer requests. When you start praying about that as a group, you have a different kind of group, and uh, God starts doing different things, maybe, than uh, you're expecting. By the way, one of the blessings of this prayer of Jesus, always for me, is as I roll along and I get down to verses 20 and 21 in chapter 17, I'm a part of his group. As a follower of Christ, you are also a part of his group, and he included you in his prayer. And that's a, an incredible blessing because Jesus says, I pray not only for these, for his group, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Hey, that filtered down to me. That filtered down to you. Over centuries, they told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, and it came to me, and I got saved. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. A lot of our testimony, how we do life together, is a big part of our testimony that radiates out to a world that does not know Jesus. And then seventh, a BFG, a Bible fellowship group, Sunday school class, small group, should teach God's truth. In chapter 18, Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then over the next several hours, he's going to go through a series of religious trials and civil trials on his way to the cross. Before Pilate, the Roman governor, Jesus makes this statement, I was born for this, and I've come into this world for this, to testify to the truth. Uh, well, God's word is the truth. And Jesus came to share that word. Now, he taught, he lived God's truth, and he challenges us to do the same. 
in our groups, often this is sort of the beginning and the end of what we think happens in a group. It, it's all about teach the Bible. We're going to teach the Bible. We're, we're going to dig into God's Word. Absolutely, it's an important part of what we do. But a lot of people don't get much beyond teaching the Bible, teaching about God. It's vitally important that the measure of the effectiveness of a Bible lesson, a message from God's Word, is not we got through the story. We learned some facts. We've picked up some new information. It's how's your life going to be different as a result of an encounter with the Word of God? What's going to change about you? What's going to adjust? What commitments have you made in response to the eternal Word of God? What, what are you doing with that? So, maybe uh, to evaluate class, you say, are people becoming more like Jesus as a result of what we did today in our group? Or are they just sitting and soaking? They just have fun expressing their opinions, uh, playing Bible trivia together. Or did they... Did, did, did somebody's life really change? Are people becoming more obedient to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are they loving their neighbor as themselves as a result of coming together? Because if those things aren't happening, you didn't get around to God's word somehow or another. You may have talked about it, but it just didn't happen. These are key, key measures for all of us who teach the Bible and who get together to study the Bible. Are group members sharing their faith more boldly? Are they living lives that are more holy as a result of this? Are they sacrificing, giving, sharing, encouraging? The impact in God's world for Jesus Christ? Because when those things start happening, the word of God has been made real and personal and powerful. God receives the glory and his family is strengthened. And it brings him great pleasure. We're going to group a lot, and we're going to focus on grouping a lot as a church, but I want to tell you, uh, if we're going to group, we want to do it in a way that really mirrors Christ. But let's do it very well. Now, invitation on this, those of you in a group, let's maximize what's happening in those groups. The other side is, if you're not in a group, we really want to get you into one. And uh, there are a lot of ways to connect. But if you're not in a group right now, you say, I'd like to try a group. Then, and there are groups, all kinds, all. Take one of those yellow cards, and you can just write it down. Contact me about getting into a group, and you can hand it to me at the uh, Connection Center after we're dismissed. Or go to the desk, this, the desk right in the middle of the rotunda, and say, I want to be contacted about a group this week. And write down your name and contact, however you want to be contacted. We'll get with you this week. Everybody needs to be in a group. That's how we are organized as a church because it's how God's organized the body of Christ. It's uh, not a big gathering alone. It's a grouping. All right.